Uh, that is more likely to uh, to go. Okay. You want me to say something? Whoa, yeah. that's wild. Right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Test, 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 test. No, no dice. Okay. Oh. Okay. Like, like if I if I tell him like a, a very quick Margot story or two. Okay, all right, I might. Uh, okay, all right, I might. Uh, I might. I might do that. Those are kind of odd stories. But you know what? It's a time to be. Yeah. Okay. I am, yeah. Right, well, I'm just gonna gotta do be comfy. Line gotta be comfy. Gotta be comfy. No, as long as I'm, no, as long as I'm, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really warm. It's really warm. Mm -hmm. So, so, function over fashion. Function over fashion. I thought about it. I thought about it. <laughs> I almost did. I almost did.
Ted, <laughs> why are you can see a bit of my biography? In the lower left, that's Margot as a youngster. She grew up north of the RP Circle, um, in a one-room schoolhouse where all grades together. She went on to study nursing and then drop out of nursing because it was too authoritarian. Um, did her PhD in behavioral endocrinology at the University of London together and went on, came with me to McMaster in 1978. She, as I said, was a consummate interdisciplinary. She co published research with and co wrote grant applications with psychologists, biologists, endocrinologists, sociologists, legal scholars, um, anthropologists. And she, in fact, was the recipient of the first Master of Studies in Law degree from the University of Toronto in 1987 when she decided, in relation to our studies of homicide, that it would be a good idea to understand what the legal profession thinks they're doing with this topic and enrolled in law school um, in her 40s. I had the pleasure and privilege of being her partner and collaborator for 35 years. And we, as Sigal mentioned, um, co-supervised a number of fine students, one of whom is today's speaker, Patrick Barclay. Pat came to McMaster as a graduate student in the year 2000. He got his PhD in 2005. Before he had completed it, he had won an award for the best student paper, or the best new investigator paper was the term used, but it was basically the best student paper at the Human Behavior and Evolution Society meetings, which is an interdisciplinary society that I still consider my pet society. Um, he got his PhD in 2005, and then he sp spent a few years at Cornell as a kind of super postdoc or postdoc cum lecturer, where basically he had both jobs simultaneously. And then he went moved to the University of Guelph as an assistant professor, and he has remained at Guelph, marching through the ranks, and just last year became full professor um, in the department there. Um, there's lots that could be said about Pat, but I don't want to go on too long. He won an early career um, scientist award from the Human Behavior and Evolution Society in 2015, the last year we were eligible for the early career, I guess. Um, and, uh, and is now on the executive of that society, so he's clearly well respected and well positioned within the main society of our interdisciplinary field. But perhaps the uh, award that he is currently smiling about the most um, was an Ig Nobel Prize um, shared with um, several other researchers last year. And I'll tell you nothing about it in case Pat's going to tell you something about it. And if he doesn't, you can email him and ask for a link to the. Um, hilarious acceptance speech that he and his collaborators <laughs> made. <laughs> Patrick. Thanks very much, Martin. It's, it's great to be back. It's been truly an honor to be, uh, to be back giving the, the Margot uh, Wilson Memorial Lecture. Um, Margot, big, big part of my life, uh, very wonderful person. And before I get into my talk, I just want to share just a couple of, of, of quick stories just uh, about Margot. Uh, my, uh, my first introduction to Margot was I was reading uh, Martin and Margot's papers as a you know, somewhat, uh, somewhat cocky fourth year undergrad, and used to like going through papers and tearing them apart, and on the debating society, and used to like trying to rip apart people's arguments. And I was reading their papers and I was getting frustrated. So I'm like, aha, they should have thought of this. Oh, no, wait, there they did. Ah, but they didn't control this. Oh, wait, no, no, two paragraphs later than they did. And it was frustrating to not be able to tear apart until I finally realized, wait a second, this is a good thing. These are the kind of people I want to go research with so I can learn how to do things right. Um, the other story, and i got to preface this by saying that Mario was one of the most wonderful human beings you would have ever met. It's very important to stress this. Lovely, welcoming, very, very warm, bringing people into the society that otherwise uh, weren't part of it, uh, reaching out to, to different groups, inviting us into, you know, into their home uh, for dinners and such. So very just super warm person. Um, but that, that, that idea of like, you know, having, having you know, good standards for the science was key. 
And so Martin mentioned a, a, a kind of a super postdoc that I was uh, doing at Cornell, and I had to interview him for this. So I kind of cobbled together a hastily crafted job talk, um, and uh, went to present it in the lab. And as I'm giving the talk, I can kind of see that people aren't really paying attention. Uh, Danny might remember this. Uh, and uh, you know, people kind of getting distracted. I get to the end, I'm like, okay, that's it. Margo just looks at me and deadpan. That was shit. <laughs> um, but because you're such a warm person, you take that not as an insult, not anything harsh, but because, oh, you, you know what? You are absolutely right. You have hit the nail on the head. It was shit. But the best thing was, you said, we're going to sit down with you, and you're going to give this talk to us every day this week. And they did. Sat through the same one hour long talk every freaking day that week. So at the time that I went to give the actual job talk, it, you know, it, it, it was a hell of a lot better than when I, than, uh, than when I got started. Uh, and, you know, so showing how they, you know, cared enough to make sure, you know, to hold the students to, to, uh, to bring out the best in them and a the high standard. So if I've ever heard some, some of my students are here, it's for the same purpose, you know, to help you to reach your full potential. And for those who know me for a while, you might see echoes of that existing talk that, uh, that Margo helped, uh, uh, helped me to, uh, to craft uh, so many years ago. So, without further ado, I want to talk about some new developments in reputation and cooperation, because this is what I primarily study. I have other lines like risk taking. We do some stuff on, on fake news in our lab and the team innocent. Without further ado, I want to talk about some new developments in reputation and cooperation, because this is what I primarily study. I have other lines like risk taking, we do some stuff on, on fake news in our lab and acetaminophen, but my primary stuff is on, uh, is on reputation. And just kind of a bit of a uh, roadmap as to where I'm going to be going uh, in this talk. You introducing the topics of why help others and reputational benefits, showing how so seeing things as a biological market adds neat new um, perspectives and predictions, evidence. give some specific examples, and apply that to some other new topics. And if we have time, we'll get right. to talk so about some uh, limitations at the end. The so let's start out with sort of a very typical view of evolution, is that evolution selects for nastiness. Right, so if evolution is survival of the fittest, right, leading to this Hobbesian war of all, each against all, or however the, uh, the, the, the Latin translates to. You know, uh, Tennyson put it uh, very poetically, nature red in tooth and claw of these animals ripping apart each other in violent competition for survival and reproduction. And to be sure, there is a lot of nastiness out in nature. However, there is also a lot of niceness where we see examples of cooperation. We see examples of self-sacrifice, honeybees sacrificing themselves for the colony. Cooperation, where cleaner fish, the little kind of blue and yellow guys, will uh, you know, help pick the, uh, the parasites off the host. Exchange of nutrients between roots and fungus. Uh, fascinating um, mutualism between plants and pollinators. So cooperation is also endemic within the, uh, within the natural world. Humans, of course, are well known for <coughs> the levels to which we bring our cooperation, our willingness to occasionally help others, to volunteer, donate blood, be a good Samaritan, etc., etc. If you look around you, you see many examples of individuals helping one another. So my question, the central question that's driving all of this, is why do humans help each other so much? Given this possibility of, you know, survival of the fittest red in tooth and claw, why does cooperation exist so much? And why do people have a psychology that leads them to help others? Now, if you've taken uh, any evolutionary stuff, you know that there's multiple ways that we can ask this question about why help. We can investigate the specifics of the cooperative sentiment. What are the proximate psychological mechanisms going on in a person's head at the time they help? What emotions are evolved? Is it empathy? Is it oneness with others? Is it warm glow? Uh, what are the physiological and neurological pathways going on within a person's head? And that's a great question, and a lot of people are investigating that. We can also uh, we can call that collectively cooperative sentiment. We can also ask, well, how does that cooperative sentiment arise within an individual? How does it develop 
uh, over time? Is it something that people are born with? Is it something that we learn from others? And if so, how? Is it imitation? Is it reinforcement learning uh, or whatnot? And this is another great question that many developmental uh, psychologists that investigate. We can also ask uh, questions about the evolutionary history of this behavior. Is the levels of helping we see, is this something that's shared with, uh, with uh, other primates? Or is this something that's relatively new in the human lineage? And finally, we can ask, what is the evolutionary function of helping? Is there some selective advantage for helping others? Do those who help others reap some kind of benefit back that is going to cause cooperative sentiment to evolve? And that's the kind of question that I'm primarily investigating uh, in my research, uh, is what might the function of this behavior be? What are the nature of the benefits about how helping others can feed back to oneself? So researchers have come up with a lot, of, um, a lot of different explanations for this. So there are some kinds of helping that provide a direct benefit to yourself. So you might provide some co common resource that others benefit from and you happen to benefit from it too. Sometimes two individuals can coordinate or cooperate in a mutualism towards a common goal. There are some kinds of help that uh, are, are beneficial because it provides benefits to some individual that you care about either because you, uh, you know, share common genes with them or because you just benefit from their presence. They do or produce things that you benefit from, what economists will call a positive externality, and so helping them keeps them alive and able to keep producing the things that you like. There are other kinds of uh, uh, bet return benefits, though, that rely on observation. So if you see me scratching your back, then you are more likely to scratch my back in return, and I benefit. Or somebody else sees me scratch your back, and then they, in turn, scratch mine. Or in some cases, when one individual helps somebody else, it conveys some information that an audience uh, it can gain useful information there. So these are the ones that I'm going to be talking about today, these reputational benefits for helping others. And kind of the, the working hypothesis that we're going here, with here is that people possess a cooperative sentiment. Whatever that cooperative sentiment has, uh, happens to be, whatever particular emotions are involved, people possess that because cooperators benefit from having a good reputation. At least this is at least part of the reason why cooperative sentiment uh, evolves you know, or is learned, whatever the development happens to be. So, one possibility is that there are some kind of signaling benefits where helping others carries uh, useful information about oneself. It can signal one's qualities to others. For example, when we see Bill Gates giving billions of dollars to charity, what can we conclude? Well, we can conclude he is filthy rich. He has billions of dollars to spare. This is something I'm going to assume nobody in this room could do. Uh, I certainly can't. Uh, so, you know, it is a, sig it is a signal of, uh, of his wealth. Uh, when somebody jumps into the river to save the baby, uh, this conveys information about their, uh, you know, their physical abilities, that they are able to do this, whereas, you know, a weaker swimmer could not do so. Or it might just con convey information about one's character. So when you, uh, if you see somebody acting as a good Samaritan and helping, uh, and helping others, uh, even complete strangers, this is, you know, this conveys information that they are likely to cooperate with you. They are unlikely to, you know, to, to cheat you, to defect on you. It wouldn't be worth it to help the complete stranger if they then intended to turn around uh, and be selfish with you. And the idea is that observers gain useful information from these signals. So we can make a prediction that individuals who provide public help will be, say, trusted more than non-cooperators, will be cooperated with more. This prediction has been overwhelmingly confirmed in a number of different uh, um, uh, places, whether it's experimental games, uh, whether it's you know, online vendors who, you know, uh, who uh, act honestly, tend to command a higher price for their products, whether it's hunter-gatherers who provide, catch and share more meat for others, tend to be preferred as campmates and possibly preferred as, uh, as spouses uh, as well. Uh, you know, co-workers, trust in organizations, even infants will look longer at agents who they've seen help others uh, rather than individuals who not. So it's been 
you know, very well uh, established. One way to test this within the lab is to use uh, um, some measure of cooperation, like something we call a public goods game. In a public goods game, you bring some number of people into the lab, say, for example, four. You give each of them some amount of money, say, for example, $10. And then each round, all of them can contribute any number of these dollars to a group fund. Group fund gets summed up, and then the experimenter multiplies it by some, uh, by some number. Everybody then gets an even share, regardless of how much they all contributed. And so, you know, it's beneficial if we, uh, everybody contributes, everybody in the group does better. But of course, the person who contributed nothing, who kept all of their money, ends up doing better than anybody else. So there's a conflict between what's best for the group and what's best for the individual. And we can provide opportunities for a reputation by pairing this with other games, like a trust game. So for example, you have a truster who is given some amount of money. They can entrust any number of these dollars to a responder who receives three times whatever was sent. The responder then gets to decide uh, how much to return. And the truster ends up better off if they trust something and the responder repays that trust. But of course, there's always a possibility the responder will return zero and the truster could end up worse off. So we can see, okay, well, people, do people show higher trust towards uh, high contributors? What we have here is the amount of money that people entrust to the highest contributor in the group, the second highest, the second lowest, and the lowest. And you see this nice relationship, people trust good cooperators more. Not that surprising. Also, people tend to be more cooperative when others are watching. So if people don't expect to gain a reputation for the cooperation, we see that cooperation tends to drop over time, where it's much higher if they know that this trust game is coming and there's a reason to build up a good reputation. More recently, this has been found with other types of reputation. This is Matthew Feinberg in Toronto, um, showing that uh, people are more cooperative when others can gossip about them, share information about who is a you know, good cooperator and who's kind of selfish. But they're really cooperative when there's not only gossip, but people can kick somebody out of the group. In which case, you really don't want people spreading information about how bad you are, so you better be good so you don't get kicked out. And a recent meta-analysis indeed showing that, yes, when we summarize all this, people are way nicer when being watched, especially when there are uh, actual you know, consequences to, uh, to, to having a reputation, and especially bigger effects in lab than, than online. Online is this kind of weird environment where uh, you know, it's kind of pseudo reputation, doesn't always track back on you. Okay, so this is all fairly standard uh, stuff about reputation. We can ask, how does the fact that people can choose their partners affect this? Because if you can choose whom to interact with, then that means that you can leave a bad partner and go find somebody better. So a fairly common result is that uh, partner choice fosters cooperation. So if we have people playing one of these cooperative games in the lab, and there's real money on the line in these games, so there's a real incentive uh, you know, uh, trade-off between what's good for the collective versus what's for the individual, um, Regardless of what, if people can switch partners, whether it's a direct cost, I'm going to pay a buck to leave that guy and go somewhere else, or an opportunity cost, I'm going to sit out, cooperation is higher when people can leave bad partners. And this forces the bad partners to be more cooperative. But what's really cool about uh, what we've seen in humans and many other species is we get what's called a biological market. And this is the idea that when individuals can choose whom to interact with, it results in a market-like competition for partners to try and get with the best partner and to try and be a good partner in order to attract the most attention from others and to get with other good partners. The example most of us are, will be familiar with is, of course, the, the mating market. Uh, where you know, individuals will choose a, choose a partner, and some individuals are you know, more desirable than others, higher quality, highly sought after. Um, and you end up with uh, you know, competition over mates, but also some level of assortment. The Channing Tatums of the world end up with the Zoe Kravitzes of the world. You know, the the B-listers with the B-listers, and then you know, so on, uh, sort of uh, down the way a little bit. 
Um, and, uh, but this doesn't just apply to mating. It also applies to other kinds of partnerships, whether it's allies, coalition partners, friends. The A clique hangs out with the A clique. The B clique hangs out with the B clique, and so on uh, down, the, down the way. So the idea in a biological market is that individuals can either do or produce things, some of which happen to benefit others, you know, either intentionally helping others or doing things that just happen to benefit them. And different individuals have different market value based on um, their relative ability to provide benefits to others, their relative willingness to provide benefits to others, and their availability. So the best partners are able to help, willing to help, and uh, available. The worst partners are none of the above. Intermediate partners are either intermediate on all of them, or they're high on one and, and, and low on another. And because we all have limited time, we don't spend all of our time equally with everybody, we pick and choose whom we associate with. This creates competition for good partners and assortment. One way to compete is to actively provide more benefits than, uh, than others. So we tested for this idea. Do people compete to be more generous than others? So we use a fairly simple uh, choice paradigm. We have people playing what's called a continuous prisoner's dilemma. Each of two people can give up to $10 to the other. Any dollar sent, the other person receives twice as much. Um, you know, so if they both give all of their money, they both walk out with 20 bucks. But of course, if A gives nothing and B gives everything, A walks out with 30, B walks out with zero. So there's an incentive to be selfish in this game. And then we have them observed by a third party who will then play this exact same game with one of them in one of three conditions. In the random anonymous condition, the observer does not see how much A and B give to each other and will be randomly paired with one of them. So there's no particular reason to be particularly generous uh, in this game other than just intrinsic motivation. In the random knowledge condition, the observer sees how much A and B give to one another and will be randomly paired with, them, with one of them. So there's an incentive to want to appear generous so that way the observer will cooperate with you. The third condition, the choice knowledge, not only does this observer see how much they give to each other, but in addition can choose whom to interact with. So this creates a competition to not just appear nice, but to appear nicer than the other person in order to be chosen. So contrasting these two tests are people just signaling to try to be, that they're nice. Contrasting these two tests that people are actively competing to be more generous than others. Um, when we ran this uh, but, uh, with a number of uh, Cornell undergraduates, we look at how much people gave when there wasn't really an incentive. These are the uh, medians, 25th, 75th percentile, 10th and 90th percentile. When there's not a lot of incentive to give, people didn't. They gave more money when there was an incentive to try and appear nice in order to be trusted with more, but they gave the most when they were in competition in order to get chosen. So kind of the first uh, evidence for competitive helping. Now, we can also I, I've, uh, model this mathematically, uh, and I'm not going to show the actual uh, math here, um, but the idea creating a mathematical model where people are competing over other people's attention using generosity. And so people attend to whoever is being generous because, hey, it's worth attending to somebody who's giving out stuff. Um, and then the, uh, you know, the most generous attract more attention from others. And if we have the degree of partner choice on the, uh, the x-axis there, what we see is if we look at what level of competing, competitive helping arises, we see that the more partner choice there is, the higher level of, uh, of competitive helping uh, evolves. And you can get uh, um, even higher levels when you start making things kind of a winner take all. Um, okay, let's start applying this to particular types of cooperation in particular scenarios. So the first one I wanna talk about is environmentalism. Because protecting the environment is a cooperative act. 
Because we all benefit from having a clean environment. Clean air, clean water, no you know, litter all over the place, you know, a, a climate that's not overheating, etc., etc. But of course, protecting the environment is individually costly. It requires me to not just throw my litter on the ground. It requires me to clean up my emissions and, and so on. Um, so there's a conflict between what's best for the individual, to be a litter bug polluter, versus what's best for everybody, which is if we all protect the environment. Previous researchers have shown that um, people invest more in environmental goods when those decisions are public than when they're anonymous. So this is in Germany, um, kind of the, the fight against climate change was just uh, heating up, no pun intended, uh, and uh, participants could uh, contribute some amount of money to a climate pool, which would fund a, um, a newspaper ad, kind of warning people about climate change, exhorting them to do something about it. The more money contributed, the larger the ad. Uh, and regardless of the exact cost of the donations, people donated more when their decisions were public and they could receive some benefit uh, from a reputation than when those were not. Okay. But will people compete to do more for the environment than others? Which is what we predict based on this biological markets and competitive helping. Well, we can test this using a very similar sort of design uh, where instead of giving to each other, we have people uh, give a chance to donate to an environmental charity. The Sierra Club is one of the largest environmental charities in the US. And they can donate to the, to the environment. And afterwards, they're observed by somebody who will then play one of these Prisoner's Dilemma uh, uh, cooperative games with them under one of the same three conditions, where either the observer does not see how much these people give to the environment and is randomly paired, the, um, or the observer does see how much they give to the environment and will be randomly paired, so there's an incentive to want to appear pro-environmental, or the choice knowledge condition where the observer can not only see but can choose whom to interact with. So there's an incentive to appear not just green, but greener than the, uh, than the other person. Uh, when we look at the results, we see a very similar pattern in terms of how much money people are giving to the, to the environment. Uh, cooperation is a little higher in this case than it was that uh, this is done in New Mexico, whether that's due to uh, the state or not, or the, the good, we're not sure. But we see that people give more when they're observed than when they're anonymous, but they give the most when doing so can influence whether or not they're chosen. We see competitive environmentalism for people to be greener than, uh, than others. Um, and in the era of replications, we did replicate this uh, with a slightly different, uh, different recruiting um, uh, kind of framing, and we see a very similar pattern here. Okay, but if environmentalism is about cooperation, we can ask some questions here. We can ask, are there benefits to being pro-environmental? Do, uh, so do, you, do observers choose the person who gave more to the environment? The answer is yes, in the vast majority of times. When, when some one person gave more to the environment than the other, then they tended to get chosen. Do people cooperate more with people who had given more to the environment? Yes, there are, there are correlations between you know, how much I give to the environment and how much you, know, you the observer, later cooperates with me. So again, there are benefits from being seen to be green. The big question is, was this giving actually an honest signal? Do people who gave more to the environment, were they actually better partners? Did they cooperate more with whoever they, they ended up with? And the answer again is, Yes. So if I tend to give a lot to the environment, I also tend to cooperate a lot more with you. If I tend to give little to the environment, I tend to give little to you. Um, and so uh, you know, depending on the condition, these are correlation values pretty strong. So obviously environmentalism is not a perfect predictor of somebody's cooperativeness. But in our study, it was a pretty good one. And so in a good way, potential to know if somebody is likely to cooperate or not. Okay, example number two, uh, romance. Um, so here are some data uh, done by uh, uh, Nicola Rehani 
um, you know, I'll give you the punchline here, is uh, online fundraising about men competing with other men in order to make donations to attractive women. So what they had is they used a real fundraiser where, uh, you, like, I think it was like a GoFundMe or something, and you can see who it is that you are, uh, you know, who's doing the fundraising. You can see if it's a guy or a girl, you can see a picture of them, what you think of them. But also, people would know whether the previous donor was male or female, and how much that person gave. What we have here, this is after a large donation, what impact does that have on the next donor relative to kind of the average donation? And what you see here, this is if it's a female fundraiser who just received a large donation from a male, what we see is men, if it's an attractive woman, men step up their game and give a large donation to compete, whereas less so if the woman is, is not as, a, as attractive. Uh, whereas we don't see that pattern in other cases. Uh, you know, if the previous large donor was female, guys aren't competing with the previous female, or if it's a male a fundraiser, the attractiveness has no effect. Okay. Are people attracted to generosity? Well, this goes against kind of the popular wisdom, right? The popular wisdom is nice guys finish last. We've all heard this, right? Um, and, you know, if you contrast something like, you know, your stereotypical bad boy, you know, here we have the wolf of Wall Street, contrasted with, you know, some nice guy, right? Who would you rather date, the bad boy or the nice guy? Well, you know, obviously the, the bad boy in this case, right? The problem is, is that these two are different on so many traits, more than just niceness or badness, right? It's Leonardo DiCaprio, right? He's attractive, he's rich. Whereas this guy's just nice, and that's about it. If we want to really see if people are attracted to generosity, we need to make an all else equal comparison. So for example, maybe we need to, to compare Wolf of Wall Street Leo with philanthropic Leo and see which do people actually prefer. So this is research going back to my, uh, my, my PhD thesis. Um, and uh, what we did is we created a bunch of simulated dating ads, um, you know, and uh, you know, somebody, some information about them. Uh, we populate that with some phrases that were pretty typical uh, uh, you know, on dating ads at the time. I don't know if people still say things like that. Uh, <laughs> um, but then what we do is we contrast, yeah, yeah. Um, we contrast that guy with this guy. So in my spare time, I like hiking, hanging out, listening to music, and volunteering at the food bank and group home. And everybody's like, aww. You know, uh, life is short, I wanna enjoy it as much as possible, and help others enjoy it, aww. And then we compare people's reactions to this guy versus this guy. And we use several variations of these vignettes. So this is not something specific about this one picture. There's something specific about this one, this one ad. And we see overall, do people prefer the altruistic version to the control version? What this is, is these are the uh, difference in standardized ratings. So we standardize the ratings based on you know, with, uh, the average for that, for that picture. Um, and if, it's, if the score is a zero, then that means that people have an equal preference for the altruistic and the, and the control. If it's positive, above zero, it means that people are preferring the altruistic version. If it's below zero, it means that people aren't liking the altruistic version. And so what you can see is, um, whether it's uh, women rating men or men rating women, there is a preference for, uh, for the more altruistic partner for uh, long-term relationships. Women are also preferring um, the altruistic men for, uh, for dates, men have no preference. Uh, you know, a general preference for, uh, for the altruism in both men and women for platonic friendships uh, and loaning money, you know, again, suggesting that people are liking the, uh, the altruistic version more than the control version. Uh, this one, I'm not gonna lie, we did not predict this, that guys would not like altruistic women. Uh, you know, I'll let you make up your own story as to uh, uh, what's going on with that one. Okay, so this is uh, uh, you know, simulated dating ads. What about real behavior in the real world? 
Well, in, uh, in collaboration with uh, Stephen Arnaki, uh, another uh, McMaster uh, uh, graduate, is we um, basically had two different measures of, uh, of altruism, two different studies, and see how it correlated with ratings like uh, you know, self-perceived mating success, lifetime number of uh, sex partners. Up top, we have people's scores on a self-reported altruism scale. And you see that at least in men, men who were more altruistic uh, were, uh, you know, had, uh, had more partners. Um, study two, we used uh, people's willingness to do donate some of their earnings in experiment uh, to a charity. And what we see is that men who di uh, did um, donate um, you know, had more partners than men who did not. And we controlled for um, things like extroversion and narcissism, just to make sure that this is not just a general over-reporting bias. Um, incidentally, just, uh, just this year, somebody else uh, uh, went to, to replicate this. Their paper, they claimed to, that they failed to replicate it, but when we reanalyzed their data, we found pretty much the same pattern. Okay. Why do people think that nice guys would be less attractive? Well. One possible reason, and I don't like this reason, is that maybe out in the real world, maybe they are less attractive. Because these are all else equal comparisons. But in the real world, all else is not equal. So imagine if you had a choice of spending your time and money, well, uh, being a star quarterback, or spending your time, say, volunteering and investing. Which is going to pay off more in terms of status? in terms of mating success? Probably this one. So what might be going on is those who do have these options, the high status options, invest in that. Those who can't are nice instead. So maybe instead of last guys finishing nice, maybe it's really last guys finish nice. So we can ask, who's going to help the most? And it's going to depend you know, are the uh, you know, attractive individuals, uh, high status can help more. It's going to depend on the kind of helping. Some kinds of helping are hard to do. They require special abilities you know, to save the, save the baby from the river, to haul somebody out of a burning building, to donate billions of dollars. Other kinds of helping are easy. Anybody can do them. It's just a simple investment of time. So if we want to know who helps more, we need to ask who's going to pay a lower cost for helping and who gets less of a benefit from helping. In terms of the cost, there are performance costs, right? Bill Gates can give away a billion dollars at a kind of a lower cost to him than it would be to me. So he's going to give more money than I will. David Hasselhoff can jump in, you know, can save the baby a lot easier than I can. And so, you know, he's going to provide more help than I can. Uh, I'm not that clumsy. Um, some people pay lower opportunity costs because, you know, the nice guy might not have the opportunity to be the star quarterback. So the opportunity cost of spending that time volunteering is lower. Thus, he might help more. When it comes to who needs a good reputation less, well, some people are already highly desirable. And so the reputational boost they receive might not be worth the cost to them, but might be worth it for somebody else. And research has sh uh, some research has shown that more attractive people are less cooperative in a lot of games. You know, they don't need that reputational boost. They can get away with being a bit more of a jerk because they're already desirable. High status people, there's some evidence suggesting that high status people uh, are a little more selfish. Again, they can get away with being a bit more of a jerk. And within a given relationship, the person who has more power in that relationship, ability to leave and find somebody else, tends to give less within the relationship. There's also this phenomenon of moral licensing, where if somebody already has a good reputation, then they don't need a, a, you know, additional helping as much. Um, and so moral licensing is when, if somebody has just done a good act, they're subsequently less likely to help, as if they have a license to be bad. Right? So this is kind of the moral equivalent of, I just worked out, now I can eat a chocolate bar. This is, you know, I just helped somebody, and now I, now I don't need to help somebody right now, uh, because they have already established uh, goodness. Okay. 
So uh, some helping requires special abilities. Uh, some just requires willingness. Which is more important in a partner? Ability to help or willingness to help? So this leads to the question of what are people going to prefer in partners? And here's where we get into stuff, some, some stuff that I've never presented before. Uh, so you know, bear with me as we work our way through this. So this idea of warmth versus competence in a partner, this is one of these you know, universal dimensions of social cognition, ways in which people uh, you know, evaluate others. You know, competent, you know, more competent, less competent, more warm, less warm. Um, in terms of you know, my perspective, these are just the psychological instantiations of things like ability to help. Somebody who is highly able to help is perceived of as competent. Somebody who is very willing to help is perceived of as, uh, as warm. And this ability to help, it can be uh, you know, done in, in a number of different dimensions, whether it's physical competence, whether it's intellectual competence, social capital, social competence, wealth, etc., etc. So which is more important in a partner? Their ability to provide benefits or their willingness? Well, a market's theory says it's going to depend on a couple of things. Most notably, how stable is that ability across time, the ability to provide benefits, and how much do people differ on that trait? So we ran a study to test whether people's preferences for uh, uh, wealth in a partner depends on its stability. So we had people um, playing an online game where they could share money with others. This is done on uh, MTurk, which is a crowdsourcing website, uh, you know, small tasks for small amounts of money. You know, and these are actually fairly sizable uh, stakes on, uh, on MTurk, given how short the experiments are. And we categorized people, whether you know, they were comparatively rich, they had a little bit more to give, and either gave you know, a fair proportion, 50%, or a stingy part, 20%. And then you know, poorer people who had a smaller endowment, and same thing, either gave half or gave 20%. And then we would have another individual who would see two of them, and given them a choice, who would you rather do this economic game with? And the wealth of the, uh, the givers would either be stable, unlikely to change, or unstable where it could change from round to round. So not surprisingly, overall as a preference, people prefer the, you know, the, the richer partners or the poorer partners. All else equal, people prefer the, the, the fair partners over the stingy partners. Um, we can ask what happens actually if, there's a, if people have to trade these off. If you had to choose between a rich and stingy person, highly able to give but not all that willing, versus a poor but fair individual who's willing to help but doesn't, can't help all that much. Who do you actually prefer uh, in, this, uh, in this case? Um, when we look at the results here, um, if both partners are fair, then, there's a, um, then uh, what we have, you know, it's, wealth is stable, people strongly prefer wealth. Not surprising, less of a preference if the wealth is unstable. But if they're forced to trade off the wealth of a partner versus the, uh, the fairness, people uh, pref strongly prefer fairness when the wealth can switch very easily. Another question, though, is when we look around, some people are rich, some people are poor. Some people are warm and friendly and cooperative. Some people are fairly selfish. Some people are, in fact, openly hostile to us. So whether we prefer able partners or willing partners is going to depend on how much people vary in these traits. And um, a couple of evolutionary psychologists uh, created a really interesting model uh, you know, arguing that the reason we generally prefer warmth, or at least claim to prefer good, warm partners, is because that's what varies the most out in the, uh, out in the real world. Because some people want to help us, and some people want to harm us. Um, and so that warmth determines whether somebody's competence is you know, good, whether they're going to be good at helping us or good at harming us. And what they did is they ran a simulation of, with a bunch of agents interacting with each other who varied in either warmth or, um, uh, or, or competence and produced a heat map as to whether agents evolved to prefer competent partners or prefer warm partners. And what they found is, just walking you through this, um, if there's a lot of variance in warmth but not in competence, so the top right here, if everybody else in the population, if they're all about equally competent, 
but some are very warm and some are not. People tend to prefer warmth. You choose what people are different on. Conversely, if there's not a lot of variance in warmth, everybody's about equally warm, but some people are very competent and some are not, you get strong preferences for competence evolving. We tested this in the lab where um, having people play a hypothetical uh, a a economic game where we kind of sequentially present, these are what other people have shared with others. And then, you know, if you were to play with somebody, would you want information about their wealth or their generosity? And in one condition is all of the individuals have about the same amount of wealth, but some are extremely selfish and some are very generous. And the other condition, it's the reverse. Everybody's about roughly equally generous, but some are very, don't have much to give and some do. And we ask, what kind of information do people seek here? And exactly as the, the other model predicts, um, you know, so and if a control condition where people don't get any information, people broadly prefer uh, to find out if somebody, if a partner is generous or stingy. That preference is amplified if there are both stingy and generous people in a population. People really want to know uh, if a partner is generous or stingy. But if a partner, if a partner's, uh, some are rich and some are poor, then that's what people value. Um, we have a kind of a follow-up study on this looking at mate preferences where we look at uh, different countries, people value wealth of a mate uh, to different amounts. So in some countries, a partner's wealth is very important. In other countries, it's not that important. People place more value on things like good character or physical attractiveness. And some countries have a lot of uh, inequality in wealth and some are more equal. And what we're finding is countries with high economic inequality, people want rich mates. And, our seat, and that is a big component of how they choose partners. In countries where everybody's more equal in wealth, People don't value wealthy partners so much and instead value things like good character, physical attractiveness, and so on. Okay. Um, there's finally one last reason to prefer warm, willing partners is you look more moral. So somebody sounds like kind of a heel if they're willing to, you know, give up on the nice guy in order to go with, you know, the, the, you know, the very rich, uh, you know, dashing, whatever. You know, it, 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 sounds kinda, it sounds kinda bad. And we have a mathematical model showing that selfish people will just prefer the able partner rather than somebody who is a, a nice person, whereas a nice person will sometimes prefer other nice people. And uh, we set up an experiment to test this where we have deciders either be uh, you know, able to help but not very willing or willing to help or, but not all that able. We have other people, some people who choose an able but willing partner, others who choose a willing but unable partner, and then we finally we have an evaluator say, well, what do you think of these different people? The person who likes the, uh, you know, the, uh, the rich guy or the person who likes the nice guy? And what we see is people who choose the nice individual rate themselves as more moral, expect others to rate them as more moral, and in fact are rated as more moral than people who, uh, uh, who give up on the, uh, the nice guy in order to go with the richer. Okay, the last thing I want to kind of go through uh, quickly here is some of the limits of, of reputation. In that, we know that people are nicer when they're observed and when they have a chance to get a good reputation. This gives us an opportunity to harness the power of reputation in order to increase cooperation by giving people more chance to develop a good reputation um, and, uh, you know, or compete over a, a good reputation to, uh, to you know, make people less nasty and, and more nice. And it sounds great, and there have been many examples of this, where people have been uh, you know, making, say, uh, electricity consumption public, and you know, people are better about their electricity cons consumption. They use less if, it, if it's public. But there are some limits with using reputation in this way. And it's worthwhile to ask, when will reputation work? When will it promote cooperation? And when won't it? Well, first of all, if you want to use reputation to get people to more co be more cooperative, there has to be a real reputation at stake here. People habituate 
if it looks like they have a reputation, but it doesn't pay out. So an example here is with punishment. Now, if people are playing one of these public good games that I talked about, there's a lot of research showing that your know, cooperation goes down without punishment. But if you give people the opportunity, do you want to pay a dollar to make that guy lose three? People will be like, hell yeah, like I'll pay three bucks, make that selfish guy lose nine. And cooperation tends to remain high when that punishment is stable. But what about verbal punishment? Or disapproval? Is this enough to motivate people to be good? If they know that people are just going to shit talk them. Or people are going to say, hey, I don't like that. Does this increase cooperation? And there's studies showing that yes, indeed it does. But of course, as any parent will know, um, is that if there are no eventual consequences to this, tangible consequences, you know, kids will certainly eventually learn to ignore these, this sort of disapproval if, it doesn't, if it's not actually followed through. And we might expect that adults are going to do the same. So if we compare the effects of monetary punishment on cooperation and just disapproval, we find that disapproval starts out a little effective, but then quickly loses its effect as people habituate to, uh, to empty threats. And disapproval ends up being no better than no punishment. Another limitation for reputation of a uh, matter, people almost value the opinion of an audience. Um, here we have some data where people are uh, helping in front of either no audience, you know, an audience that uh, can't really do much, or uh, a low-value audience that can't help them much, or a high-value audience that can help them a lot. And what we see is if it's a low-value audience, being observed doesn't really matter all that much. So, uh, you know, it, it's kind of the equivalent of people, I don't care if that person is watching, because they can't really affect me. But perhaps most importantly, people compete over reputation in nasty ways. Now, if you're in competition with somebody, there's two ways to win a competition. One is to step up your own game and try and appear nicer than them. The other is to bring them down and make them stop being as cooperative so that you don't look bad by comparison. When one person increases their relative reputation, others look bad in comparison. And so people may try to derogate a do-gooder. Uh, you know, oh, they're a vegetarian? Oh, but they're wearing leather shoes. What a hypocrite. <laughs> um, you know, in order to kind of bring that person down, reduce the reputational benefits. And so we predict that when people are competing over a good reputation, they will be more likely to do this do-good or derogation, or what we call antisocial punishment, punishing the good guy instead of the bad guy. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there, there's more incentive to attack cooperators when uh, you're competing for a good reputation. So we tested this uh, you know, using a, a public goods game that I've talked uh, about a couple times where people can contribute money to a group fund. And then afterwards, we give people a chance to punish each other. You know, do you want to pay a buck to make somebody else lose three? And the experimenter can code that as moralistic punishment. So it's, it's directed at the, the selfish people. Or antisocial punishment, it's directed towards good cooperators. And they play five rounds of this. And our competition condition is the same, except afterwards, there is an observer who can trust them with a whole whack of money. And so there's competition to trying and be the nicest individual in order to be chosen. And so in this condition here, there's an incentive to bring down everybody else, to stop them from looking so good, because it makes you look bad by comparison. And we see, is there more punishment of the good guys in this condition when people are competing to look good than there is in this case? And what we get is quite a strong uh, effect here. There's much more of this antisocial punishment when people are competing to be chosen than when they are not. 
And I've left kind of the stats in here just to kind of like, that, that's a, for those of you who know effect sizes, that's kind of a huge effect size. You know, small, medium, and large is normally 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. So this is way stronger than that. This is almost as big of a difference as like the average height difference between, say, men and women. Uh, it appears right in the first round uh, uh, as well. And furthermore, this antisocial punishment stops cooperation from escalating. Normally when this punishment, cooperation goes up, but when people are competing, there's so much of this, you know, crapping on the good guy that uh, uh, that cooperation doesn't go up. Now, um, normally punishment is good. We like the person who punishes the bad guy. We can test this by saying, imagine there's a person in the group who did not contributing anything. If you found out that somebody else punished them, how would you feel about them? And we see that people rate punishers better on a number of things than they rate non-punishers. We also see that uh, people tend to choose. So it, uh, you know, if you're choosing amongst other people, people tend to choose good helpers more than bad helpers. People tend to choose more, bigger punishers rather than non-good punishers. And punishment normally is a signal of how trustworthy somebody is. So if we look at uh, how much people return in a cooperative game, these lines here, we see that people who help more tend to be more trustworthy. People who punish more are more trustworthy than people who punish less. So normally punishment is a signal of cooperativeness, but it can be taken to excess as we see today in things like online shaming, where we see disproportionate punishment of individuals, presumptions of guilt, and so on. And shaming, we can kind of think about as a form of competition over reputation. Make yourself look better by putting others down, for good or for bad. But at least this perspective offers a solution on how we can fight that, by possibly giving people a better way to signal their cooperativeness, rather than just by putting others down. And um, what we have here is uh, some data about how people rate punishers and non-punishers. If people only know about what somebody's punishment, then they like punishers more than non-punishers. But if they, people also know whether somebody helps, they rely more on that. They ignore punishment. People do less of this nasty punishment. And so possibly this might be one way to reduce the kind of excess punishment that we sometimes see in modern worlds by giving alternate ways for people to signal their, uh, uh, their cooperativeness. Okay, so kind of summarizing all this, the ultimate goals of all this research are to understand the signaling aspects of cooperation. What information is conveyed about a person when they help others, when they punish others? Understand how market forces shape and continue to shape cooperative sentiment and to help build and harness a science of reputation. To take all of these different kinds of helping to ultimately start linking them. I've talked mostly about signaling. I have other work on stake and look at how these all relate to each other and to eventually to take it and build perhaps a grand unified theory of helping behavior that links all these to understand when and why people will help others. So with that, uh, I will thank a whole bunch of people who have helped uh, out with a whole bunch of uh, these projects. Uh, and especially the people who have, uh, who have funded this research over the years. Thank you. We have time for a few questions, and I want to invite everybody to the reception upstairs on the second floor after the talk and after the questions. So I think the first question might be right up there with Sook, and I'll let you take your own questions. Pat. Sure, yep. A couple of questions actually. So one is just a general one. I just, as I was listening to you talking about all your results, I couldn't help thinking about how some of these effects might, might vary or be moderated by political orientation. Yep. And I just wondered if you've got thoughts on that. That's the first one. The second one is the general preference that we seem to have for cooperators. Is it more about kind of the potential benefits we might accrue from, from engaging with a cooperator, or is it more about loss of uh, okay, great questions. So first of all, uh, political uh, orientation, that's a great question. I haven't investigated that. Um, I mean, some of them, uh, you know, 
everybody benefits from being with the cooperator, so that will matter. The one that might vary the most, you're probably thinking about the environmentalism one. Um, so that's, that's really interesting. Environmentalism is very politically polarized these days, but it wasn't always that way. So, you know, uh, which, uh, which government instituted the, um, you know, created the Environmental Protection Agency? Richard Nixon's Republicans. You know, who, uh, which governments did the most to fight acid rain? Uh, you know, Reagan's Republicans, Brian Mulroney's Conservatives. Um, you know, so those were cases where, you know, there's very clear benefits of cleaning up the environment, right? The Cleveland River just caught on fire. Okay, we clearly need to do something about this pollution. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it can be made uh, environmental, and there are some conservative environmental, organi uh, environmental organizations t uh, as well. Um, you know, they're seeking, to, like, they're, you know, we are protecting our local environment. And so I would predict uh, the same effects in that case if it were a, an environmental good that conservatives cared about, like protections of wetlands for duck hunting, Ducks Unlimited. Um, you know, whereas you know, they might not care about kind of more general abstract stuff like climate change. Um, so uh, great question. Many of the others would predict to, uh, you know, to generalize as long as there's a benefit for um, uh, associating with cooperators. The second question, if I understood correctly, was is this, about, is, is this about getting with good cooperators or is it about avoiding selfish individuals? And that's a great question. Um, I kind of see these as part and parcel. They're two sides of the same coin. Um, and you can expect some things like, if everybody is generally cooperative, you can generally assume any new person you meet is going to be cooperative. And so as a result, the very few selfish individuals stand out. We detect those cheaters because they're rare. Conversely, if you're in, in an environment in which everybody's selfish, but there's one really, really generous person, then that person will stand out. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not about avoiding the, the bad guys, it's about getting with that one, and that people will remember the cooperators. And so I do have another study, which I didn't have time to talk about, showing that whether people remember the cooperators or remember the selfish individuals depends upon which one is rarer. Okay, let's go, David. Um, so I'm, the study where you varied the amount they gave or the amount of money they had. Yeah. Um, Reminds me of the, the concept of income inequality. Yes. And in, in your case, when they were when there's a lot of variance in income, yep. there was a lot more materialistic or less warmth. Yes. And is that related to the murder rate results in income inequality? Um, so I mean the the income inequality, I, I wouldn't say that you know the, the preference for wealthy individuals is going to you know, be directly related to, to, to the murder rate, the, mur the high inequality is also going to cause, you know, the risk taking, right? There's more people in kind of a desperate uh, position, uh, you know, who kind of need to take that risk. Um, you know, inequality will have a whole bunch of negative effects. I was looking at it as being more materialistic. Okay. So you're becoming more materialistic in the high income inequality, less materialistic, you're more worried about the internal quality of the individual. Right. I would say the... Um, the more that you know, the the more important that money is in a given society, then the more that that inequality matters, right? If if there's economic inequality, but everybody is you know still getting married, having the same number of kids, and everything, then people might not mind so much being you know being poor. But if it really affects survival and reproduction, that's when inequality is going to matter uh, a lot more. Um, and people are going to have a greater preference for wealthy mates in those places because that's your ticket to survival and reproduction. Yeah? Have you considered cultural background or if someone is the firstborn compared to or having siblings or...? Right. So great question. So um, one of the interesting things here is that uh, these general ideas can help explain what the cultural differences are going to be. Uh, so, so we're generally looking for principles that are going to cut across, you know, apply to many cultures. So for example, some cultures, you know, there's high in income inequality. Um, others, there's high variance in warmth. Some cultures, it's very easy to switch partners and find a new cooperator. In other cultures, what we call low relational mobility, um, you know, it's you, who you know from when you've grown up, you're kind of stuck with them. So there's less partner choice. That's also going to impact, um, you know, the, the level of generosity that you see, the, amount, the extent to which you cooperate with strangers. 
Um, so we can start, uh, people are starting to use some of these ideas to make cross-cultural predictions about how different cultures are going to vary depending upon other socio-economic, uh, 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 socioeconomic principles. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, Ruben. Oh, sorry, yes, okay. Right, so, um, that's, uh, oh yes, sorry, thank you. <laughs> uh, so the question is, um, disapprovals, it's surprising that, there, uh, that it didn't have this long-term effect. Given that we're so social, you'd think people would care about disapproval. Well, in, in the real world, disapproval is kind of like the warning rattle before a strike, right? So it's, you know, it's a cue of, you know, I don't like this, you keep doing that, Eventually, there's going to be consequences, whether I leave, whether I, you know, uh, you know impose direct costs, you know, stop doing what you're doing. Um, so in the real world, disapproval can have an effect because in the real world, it does tend to be followed up with consequences. Um, and, uh, and what we showed is in the first, um, you know, in, in the first few rounds, there, uh, there was an effect. Um, well, let me just see. Well, maybe I need to go back further than I thought. Um, here we go. Nope. Right, so cooperation did go up in the first few rounds because people are, do kind of expect disapproval to, to, to have an effect. But eventually, after a while, they habituated and realized that, okay, this, this has never followed through. There aren't any actual long-term consequences for this. And so eventually they habituate to this, what's ultimately a, a false cue of reputation uh, because it's not backed up with, that, with any consequences. So, I mean, this has implications for things like, uh, um, you know, people trying to do things like, uh, you know, on people's energy bills, give like a smiley face if you have low energy use or a frowny face if you're a big, uh, uh, you know, a, a big user of electricity. You know, this kind of suggests that, well, this might work in the short term but people might eventually come to ignore uh, those, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down uh, if it doesn't actually, if, if nobody actually knows and it doesn't actually affect anything. Yeah? I love wondering if there's any evidence on, like, diminishing returns for reputation. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of surprised in one of your studies where, in that, like, choice knowledge condition, yes. people are more sort of cooperative in the first game. Yeah. Yeah. Because in the second game, there's really no incentive to be cooperative because you've already gotten the partner to pick you. At that point, you could be selfish. Yes. So great question. Uh, kind of two parts of the question. One is, is there diminishing marginal returns for a reputational benefit? And the other is, you know, will people send a fake signal by appearing nice and then screw somebody over? Uh, and the answer is yes to both of them. Um, so yes, uh, we explicitly do predict diminishing marginal returns. Um, the mathematical model that I presented, you know, it, it kind of has that built in where eventually you know, you're getting enough attention, you don't really benefit from each additional unit of attention. Um, and that puts a natural limit as to how much, uh, you know, the level of competition, right? So, you know, you get pe my people competing to be nice, but, you know, we don't get like, you know, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to literally rip my heart out and give it to you. Um, you know, because that's, you know, that, uh, yeah, that's escalating a little, a little too far. Um, on the point uh, about the, sorry, what was the second part again? Yes, whether, whether, yeah, so in, in the one game, there was a lot of false signaling where people would, you know, the Cornell students were all, I'm going to give and give a lot, and then now they just choose me, nope, not giving anything, right? So there was a lot of that false signaling, and there is uh, existing work as to when are, the, when are these signals going to be honest. Um, one of the things it depends upon is how, how long are we going to interact in the second game, where... In a one-round one game, there's an advantage to appearing nice and screwing somebody over. But if it's going to be repeated interactions, I can screw you over once, but then after that, you don't trust me anymore. So it's not worth it for me to appear nice if I'm going to screw you over once, whereupon you don't trust me. Um, so that's when these signals can be honest. And it's, it's related to some um, hypotheses on like, uh, you know, the costly signaling theory of religion. 
uh, which is you know, religious behavior as a costly signal of, I'm going to cooperate with everybody in this group. And it relies on, you know, I get, you know, stay in this group, and I am, it shows that I'm going to be around for the long term. So great questions. Maybe one more question, and then we'll break up for the, for the reception. Okay. Let's go with, uh, do you still want a question? Or? Sure. Okay. Right. So, so really interesting, interesting question about can we apply this to things like uh, you know, you know, basically nasty male behavior, especially male behavior towards uh, towards women. Um, and I, I haven't done any work directly on that, but you know, some of the general principles uh, could, in theory, apply and look at well, what is what are the reputational benefits? for um, being nice versus what are the reputational benefits for you know, other kinds of behavior. So if there's a lot of male-male competition, then you'd expect guys to, and if that really affects you know, social success, reproductive success, then you'd expect guys to invest a lot in appearing tough, proving their macho-ness, their manliness to other guys, um, if that's a major determinant of, of, of social success. But if that's not, then, um, you know, if, if instead there are big benefits for appearing nice instead of appearing tough, then people will, you know, we predict that people will start to signal that instead. Compete over niceness instead of competing over macho-ness. Um, and so the idea is can we try and change what the reputational benefits are for being, you know, macho versus nice and make it so that that will, you know, reinforce, uh, you know, reinforce niceness instead of nastiness. Um, and uh, you know, maybe this is a good way to end in the words of evolutionary rapper uh, Baba Brinkman. Uh, you know, the song title of one of his songs is Don't Sleep With Mean People. Uh, and I think that kind of summar summarizes it as a way to create that reputational pressure to select for niceness <laughs> instead of nastiness. Okay. Well, I just want to say uh, thank you, Pat. You both signaled your confidence and your <laughs> everybody to help me in thanking uh, Pat for what was a very terrific talk. I'm sure if Margo was with us, she'd say that was terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so, you. I, I, I like <laughs>